to be recorded and posted on YouTube so that you can come back to enjoy these wonderful memories over and over and share it with your colleagues. Uh, I record all my talks and, and videos and put it on YouTube and, and actually uh, I found that uh, a college professor has actually used my videos um, you know, talking about the flip caution process. I'm like, wow, that's pretty, pretty freaking amazing. Uh, so, uh, so um, actually, you got the sign-up sheet? I have it. Um, so we're going to have a sign-up sheet, so uh, after things are done, just write down your email address and I'll email you um, the, the link to the video and also uh, uh, a document with all the resources I'm going to be talking about today. And all we need is your email and your seat. Yeah, just email. You don't have to tell us your whole life, it's okay. Just the yeah. email the state will be perfect. And you're not going to be solicited for anything. It's just going to say, thanks for coming to my session, and here's some information, and, and uh, stuff like that. So, we're talking about flipping the classroom today. You know, uh, We're going to be talking about the why, the what, and also the how. So in this one hour time, we're going to be covering a whole lot of bases to, to get down that path. You know, we're going to be using free online tools. We all love the word free. and There's a lot of really great free tools out there that allow us to be able to flip the classroom. And we're also going to, I'm going to be focusing on my, uh, online accountability, which is a, an area that's not really addressed with uh, flipping in class. Student mastery and, and rigor. You know, rigor is something that uh, is, uh, is not, not covered uh, quite thoroughly. My name is Nye. I'm founder and president of KP Compass. And we have Chef Linda Burns here. And she's a culinary arts instructor at the Southwest Career Academy in Las Vegas, Nevada. So, thank you very much. Okay. All right, Ooh, we've got more people coming in. Thank you. All right, so first question I'm gonna ask the audience today is, why do we flip? Anybody have an answer to that? And don't tell, don't, if you know the answer, like because you've seen like lots of information before, don't, don't answer, but for those of you who, <laughs> who aren't sure, well, why do we flip? You know, what's, what's, what's one of the reasons why you think we should flip? Anybody? They all wait? Okay, yes. Uh, maybe because you want to put the substance of what kids do at the forefront as opposed to like the bookwork or the, the boring stuff. Substance at the for forefront? That's a, that's, a good, that's a good answer. Yeah, you want to put, put uh, information and uh, try, try to minimize book work. That's very good. Anyone else? Yes, you in the back. Um, one of the things that I've been talking about with my staff is that traditionally, because I'm, I'm trying to build their mindset so that we can get here. Um, that traditionally we give them all the, the knowledge level things in class and then send them home to do all the hard application. And so what I said was do, let them do the easy things at home or when they're on their own and then when they have you as a resource, let them do the hard stuff. She's on the money. Come on down. Bingo. Here we go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's exactly the, uh, the, 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 the answer. So right we're done here. Well, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, absolutely. You know, flipping the the application and knowledge acquisition process so that FaceTime it becomes that much more valuable. You know, FaceTime is always valuable. The time you get with your kids, one hour a day, they they ain't gonna cut it. So you gotta maximize that time. So uh, with that, uh, what, you know, this statement really uh, harkens on the, on the kids of today because one of the things that we flipping in classrooms is we want to get away from the boring book work, as uh, this lady pointed out, because the textbooks of yesterday don't fit with the students of tomorrow. So with flipping the class, we're actually engaging students with not book work, but with other materials that, that are more relevant to their daily lives uh, with technology. So uh, I'm gonna spend uh, just a couple minutes talking about myself, because you're probably sitting up there thinking to yourself, why is this kid talking to me, a seasoned educator, about this concept? You know, why is it why 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 is it important for me to relay this information to you? you know, He's why? way older than <laughs> Yeah, don't give it away. Come on. <laughs> so you know, first thing I wanted to tell, mention to everyone is that I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> like most of your technology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then uh, like you know, I was exported here when I right, when I arrived at, at a tender age of two, and I grew up here in the United States uh, when when my parents immigrated over here. So because I was made in Taiwan, one of my problems growing up in life is that English was my second language. Um, I had reading problems because of that. I had to go to speech class for two years so I could properly enunciate the words that I'm trying to say. I think they did a good job, right? The speech <laughs> teachers. Yes, wonderful. So, so, but the thing is, like, you know, I grew up with, with, with learning disabilities, learning problems. 
So, um, I also grew up in a Chinese restaurant. So, what's the natural thing to do when you immigrate from, uh, from China or Taiwan? You open up a restaurant, right? <laughs> so, because of that, you know, we, we didn't have very much money. We were living on food stamps, and, and you know, even though we were a restaurant. <laughs> and, uh, and we didn't have all the opportunity in the world, which is actually a good thing because, like, you know, I developed ADHD. Um, well, I was very hyper, I, I couldn't, things couldn't hold my, my attention very well, and I had to have a lot of stimulus. But back then, you know, uh, one of the solutions was putting kids on Ritalin, right? But my parents were so poor, they never took me to a psychiatrist. Because of that, I turned one of my greatest deficiencies to my greatest asset. So I'm actually able to absorb and understand and actually uh, take on information at a far higher rate than my peers. Because I was able to learn to, to transfer that energy into other areas. So rather than putting a band-aid on it and making it try to go away, I had to learn to cope with it. So uh, thank goodness for that because I could do so much more with that. So because I had uh, that, that uh, problem there, um, I love video games. Video games held my attention. Uh, they were like you know, a, an outlet for me so I could like, you know, concentrate on that and do, do, uh, do my focus on uh, trying to pass a level a hundred times sometimes <laughs> because I had to do that. So, um, so I, want, I only mention this to you because back then, that was a growing problem. Now, everybody's got it, right? <laughs> so those kids are the kids that basically I was back then. Um, so because of that, I, I gravitated towards computers, which is a wonderful outlet because I was able to do a lot of wonderful things on computers back then. And I stopped, taught myself programming, which le leads to where I am today, which is a, a, a very big uh, proponent and evangelist on digital learning. So I spent my entire life developing tools because this is a very selfish reason. I wanted to make tools that work for me, that the education system just kind of like, you know, didn't understand, but I wanted to do something that worked for me because I, I'm like that, uh, a certain segment of the population that uh, people can't really build things for. So let's talk about Linda here. Yes, well, I'm his sidekick, okay? And I was a chef for 20 years in New York City. I worked primarily in, in Manhattan. Um, I worked at the start of the Food Network, so that's how old I am. When the Food Network was a baby, you know, I knew Tom Clickia when he had hair. You know, I hung out with Bobby Flay and those guys when they were all young and upcoming chefs. It was a wonderful experience. Um, I was in charge of training in several places, worked my way up from prep cook, line cook, eventually sous chef and exec chef, and then when I got into hotels and corporate, um, corporate uh, dining, I wound up beginning to train people. So then I said, well, you know, typical training, uh, we need to find some things to help supplement it. You know, you do your, your job shadowing and then you'd have some technology, you'd have some lecture, you'd have a combination, but I always like to add technology to it. Um, I started teaching culinary arts in 2007 in Las Vegas and I love it and, um, you know, I like learning and growing with these career academies with this technology and I think this is definitely the way of the future. And even though we're here lecturing in front of you now, uh, <laughs> my goal as a teacher is to minimize lecturing. Um, and it doesn't matter what the subject is. You know, some people are saying, like, how can you flip a culinary classroom? I'm going to tell you how I did it later. Um, <clears throat> but to minimize lectures and to maximize the application time that you have with your student. Oh, you just said that. And I said it. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. wonderful. So, uh, so for, you know, for kids, you know, they're growing up in a world where they have the information at their fingertips. So I'm going to pop over to this video here. Okay, we're going to stick this in here, and then I'm going to pour in the milk. <laughs> I hope this works because I didn't bring a change of pants. Look, I googled it. It's a fake picture. Actually, the majority of it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so anyway, so kids are growing up with information at their fingertips. They whip out their phones, smartphones, and they go, hey, I don't know something. I can get to it now. Boom, 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 Google it, and then they know, and they put it away and move on. It's just like that. Gone are days where you actually had to go somewhere, to the library, to a, a location to find and, and look up information. I had that World Book Encyclopedia. <laughs> yes. Uh, gone are the days where, um, where 
you have to uh, go search this uh, Dewey Decimal System. Or even worse, go look through like, uh, like hundreds of articles in Microfish and find that one article that you've been researching for the past three hours. And you say to yourself, this is the article I'm going to base all my research off of because I worked so hard for this article. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, because now we have the information, the world's information right at our fingertips. And that's what they're expecting. So when they're in the classroom, they want to have that kind of, like, you know, that, that kind of access and acknowledgement. So, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to flip the traditional classroom, as everyone knows. The traditional classroom doesn't fit, right? That's right, it doesn't. Yeah, you want to say anything else? <laughs> sure, okay. Well, the traditional classroom, they, they spoke about, actually, our keynote mentioned, you know, that we had wooden desks, everybody lined in a row, and now we want to have tables where, you know, there we encourage kids to, to collaborate and make it so that way you can teach from any part of the room. You know, these rooms should be set up where there's a circle and I and I could be in the middle. And <laughs> this way we could address every single person you know, personally. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we've, we've been hearing it many times from other speakers. Everybody's talking about it, and, uh, and it's important. So I'm going to show you this one video, which is actually uh, made by Kate Katie, who is a math teacher. A really great explanation of the concept. Anybody seen this video before? I one, two, okay, good. Few of you. I've been teaching math for the last five years, <coughs> and this is why I flipped my classroom. Yeah. 
So, uh, so I think the key critical part is I, I love this image here is because like you know what what flipping classroom does is it puts you in the center, and that's the most important aspect. A lot of teachers are afraid of like you know am I, is my job on the line? Is technology going to take over? Am, am I going to become ir irrelevant? But actually, what happens is you become even more important. You are more useful. You're much more useful to your students this way than you really are. Absolutely. And it works for you know core and CTE classes and electives. It could be any class where this will work. So I know sometimes there are classes that say, oh, that won't work in my room, but it really, they could work in math, it could work anywhere, because math teachers are always the hardest to sell on change. Okay, so the next, uh, here we go, it's, it's very important, it is. Okay, what kind of teacher are you? What kind of instruction do you like? Are you the lord of the board, right? That's yeah, the first one. The flipped classroom doesn't fit for everybody. That's the important thing. It's, not, it's not a solution for everybody. So, you know, is this how you teach? Right, if this is how you teach, then perhaps this classroom won't work for you. Okay, the Lord of the Board. Or are you the guy by their side? Do you actually go and interact with you know, the student one at a time? Right, are you that kind of teacher? Mm -hmm. Taking them through the information superhighway and being there for them. Um, do you apply differentiated instruction? You know, are different students are different learners. Some are visual, some are auditory. There's different kinds of learning. Are you able to do that? Um, do you create multimodality models of learning? And basically, you know, what that means is like with technology, uh, one of the things is like when you're providing instruction, you're providing it in one modality. And if a student uh, reacts better uh, through a different model, then you have to uh, provide individual instruction. But so with technology, what we're doing is we're augmenting your abilities by putting stuff on online and in the internet and giving them uh, a choice. Like, you know, we, I call it basically a buffet of choice of, of what fits their learning style. So. So then not everyone has the same taste. So if somebody learns best with hands-on, then they could focus on that, and then that could be that, that group that you work with. But some might only respond to lecture, and some might just be the book learner. So then you, know, you have all these different choices, and what we're doing is we're providing them choice with, with the flipped classroom concept. And do you and can you use technology as a tool in your classroom? And the people that can, this is definitely for you. But you know, Remember, with, with the flipped classroom, a lot of the technology may be used outside the classroom as well, and we'll address issues that come up with that too. Absolutely, and that's really important because uh, you know, if, if they're not able to uh, to use technology or are willing, unwilling to change, then that will be a, a very big roadblock. I've actually worked with uh, or talked to a, a tech center a while back, um, and they actually did a, a full like you know either you you change, you stay on board, or you jump ship, and obviously some teachers can. Uh, Except that, so, so they left. But that was a really harsh model, but they did a really good job in implementing it because they had like technology counselors, curriculum developers, working with all the teachers so that they could uh, properly employ it. So, so if you come up with a great plan, uh, then you could actually you know, flip your entire campus. But, you know, that's well, I actually said something at lunch to our table. It was actually, I, I can't say that it was my own though, because it was a Tony Robbins line that, well, in education, like in any other business, the only constant is change. So that's what we have to you know, be prepared for. That's the only constant is change. All right, so you know, this is a, a, a learning theory that uh, I've been working on, which is uh, about the video game generation. So over here on the left, you see, oh. <laughs> uh, you see like, you know, iconic cartoon characters. So these are the characters that like, you know, entertain you as a kid or while you're sitting in front of the boob tube or the television set. So when, when you were growing up, like the parents, they would put you in front of TV. Of course, they're not supposed to. And then, they, and then you'd be entertained by these wonderful television programs. You'd laugh with them. You'd, you'd identify with them. You know, you love Mickey Mouse. You go to Disneyland uh, or Smurfs or Felix Cat. So, so you're being uh, entertained uh, in a passive manner by sitting in front of the television. So that actually mirrors like you know, a lot of the kids when, when growing up in the uh, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s because we're passively being entertained. So in the, the classroom model where we're sitting in front being lectured at, that actually worked because that's how we were trained as kids. Now, fast forward to now, you know, we have the PlayStation controller and we have video games. So kids are now identifying with these iconic characters. So they're being entertained by these characters, they're, uh, they're identifying with them, uh, they're, they're blowing stuff up, uh, but, <laughs> but the, the key is that uh, uh, is that instead of being passively entertained, now they're active. They're controlling the destinies of these avatars. They're controlling what Mario does. So if Mario jumps in a pit and dies, well, what's, what am I going to do? Well, I'm not going to jump in that pit anymore. So they're being trained that, you know, that uh, when they're engaging with this content, the video game content, they, they have control. 
And that's what one of the things that they're really <coughs> seeking is in the education system, they want to have that same control. They want to control their learning. They want to control everything because that's what they were trained to do as kids. So they could actually manipulate the, these video games. So what do you think? What do you think about that? <laughs> there, right. So because of that, you know, we these are kids who are growing up, and we take them into a, a, a very uh, very regimented environment, and then they disconnect because they're like, okay, you know, I'm just here um, as a warm body, and, and I'm not going to do anything uh, until I get to the point where I can do hands on. So flipping the class was made popular by Khan Academy. Have you, anybody here heard? Uh, Heard of Khan Academy? I hope everyone has. Uh, now, Khan Academy, what, what Sonic Khan did was he put math videos online a number of years ago, and teachers started using it. And they started like saying, hey, kids, like, you, know, you can watch these YouTube videos at home, and we're going to discuss these concepts uh, when we come into class. Now, actually, Khan actually didn't invent the flipped classroom concept. The flipped classroom concept has been around for over a decade. But actually, flipped classroom concept has been around for over like centuries. Because what I call flipped classroom is homework. 2.0. So what we're, do, what we're doing is we're engaging the kids using digital content, using things that are more relevant to them. So back in the day, we would send them home with books because that was really the only medium that we had to get, convey information. Now we have a smorgasbord uh, or a buffet of choices of information so that they could uh, do their homework now. So we're trying to reintroduce homework back into the education system using the technology, hence flipping. <coughs> Okay, so what do we need? What do we need to give them this kind of homework that's going to be relevant to them? So we need content, right? So we need PowerPoints, documents, PDFs, websites, video, podcasts, anything paid for. And uh, OER, Open Educational Resources. Anybody uh, tap into your open OER content? Uh, they're really wonderful because they're usually uh, funded by universities. So it's basically content that universities put out. Uh, for, for use in the classroom for absolutely free. And there's a lot of that information out there. So just search for Open Educational Resources and you'll find a ton of really great information out there for that, so. Right, so we need that content and then we need a way to deliver that content. Yeah. Right. So, um, actually, before I get into that, there are evaluations here and, um, and uh, I'm gonna actually. I could do that. Thank you, <laughs> just like passing down. <laughs> Don't forget to complete these evaluations and, and be brutally honest. <laughs> so we need devices. So one of the things that, that you need yes, to put you need like you know, technology, you need computers, laptops, mobile devices are, are becoming popular now, as well as tablets. So with, uh, with these devices, these are basically their, their gateway to this content and information. So you don't have, so, and these devices are multi-purpose, so it's not like you're buying a device for just one specific uh, Avenue. But uh, one of the things is like, you know, what do we do about technology and equity? My school can't provide devices for every single kid. Um, so one of the big movements that's coming around is called BYOD. Not BYOB, BYOD. Uh, bring your own device. And what it is, is basically schools embracing the fact that these kids have these devices at home. These kids have these smartphones. These kids have this technology. And instead of uh, uh, putting a roadblock and saying none of these are available, they're starting to embrace that and say, hey, bring it in if there's applications for it in your classroom. And a lot of teachers are starting to do that. Uh, there's a lot of articles out there that are in support of this because one of the things that a lot of schools have found is by allowing for devices, their rates of infraction have become like drastically reduced, uh, violating uh, violations. So instead of like students hiding in and doing texting in their pocket or or, uh, or trying to do things subversively, they, you, you have these devices out there, and then the, the uh, and they don't want it taken away. So if they're out, then you can see it. They're not going to use it for for other purposes. Well, I see, in our school, we have to bring your own device. We had we rolled out an iPad program for our juniors and seniors in our high school, and we've actually been able to open it to our freshmen and sophomores. And we only had a limited amount. We had about 400 for a school of 1,500 um, for kids to check out uh, for the year. And because so many kids have their own devices, we were able to, with that same bank of equipment, we were able to open it up to freshmen and sophomores because kids are bringing in their own Kindles or they're bringing in their own tablet, whatever it is they have. So the investment that you have to make as a school or a school district probably is not as high as you would expect. Mm -hmm. And actually, parents are willing to pay for this. So yeah, we, there was a recent survey by Tomorrow.org, uh, Project Tomorrow, uh, where they surveyed like the. Um, uh, thousands upon thousands of parents, teachers, uh, administrators uh, about uh, buying devices. And they say, yes, I will pay $200 for a Kindle Fire if there's actually an application used for it in the school. They're willing to make that investment. You know, 
Just like how back in the day we had to, uh, all the kids had to buy their own graphing calculators for 150 bucks, right? Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Remember that? Yeah, remember that? Yeah. So you know, so we, so it's a really great movement, and you, it, you should embrace it. Actually, uh, anybody here uh, using doing BYOT right now? So a few of you. Uh, anyone want to comment on that? Uh, I know Linda just said something about it, but uh, anybody um, about like you know how effective it was? It's effective. We still we're in a high poverty district, and so there's still plenty of kids that don't have it. Um, but <coughs> you know, kids are willing to share too. So that they are. Yeah, absolutely. And then you can buy a few devices and then use those as supplemental. Yes. The uh, the problem with bringing your own devices is a lot of school districts won't allow the device to have access to their network for fear of virus, for fear of inappropriate logging in, that sort of thing. Well, that's the IT director not properly setting up the filters. Yeah. yeah. And right. Have a separate yeah. Say if it's blocked, yeah. it's blocked. <laughs> yeah. 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 It should be anyway. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're relatively new in our school system. We're in Hampton, Virginia. And um, they just set up, the, the IT department set up a separate network um, specifically for guests and students to use um, their devices. And so far, it's more of a buy-in type thing. We, we're doing professional development to show teachers how it can be used um, for specific subjects because that's, that's the, the biggest concern in our, our school district is we have this thing, now how do we use it? And it's, it's easier said than done, and so we recognize that. And so uh, that's the only hang up, is just having teachers understand how mm -hmm. to use it um, and adopt lesson plans that work for them. Yeah, and, and that's really important because it's all about application. So you, you, so finding the right application for that it makes the device relevant. Yeah, that's what I was going to say too. Is it also sets parameters for when it's acceptable to have that device I was about to say in your that. hand and when it's not, and so you know exactly when you know the student's not there with his cell phone underneath the table trying to text somebody or play with it because it's either cut and dried, it's either acceptable behavior or it's not acceptable behavior right, the kids to be need using to your technology, mm -hmm. and so it's easier to control. Yeah, so last one. Uh, uh, Yes. I'm looking out the morning and they're taking that. We've got prop, um, programs that are inside um, 360, is that right? I think it's called. Science 360? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. And then other sites so that the teacher knows if they go offline and do your work on here, everybody's got their iPad and all that that shows Joe's offline. Oh, okay, cool. So you got monitoring device yeah, things monitoring. too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's a lot of wonderful solutions. And I could devote an entire hour and a half on iPads. I do iPad discussions as well. Uh, and those are online too. <laughs> so you can, if you just Google me, uh, you'll find it. So um, so that's me when I gave my own uh, OD. And I'm just going to tell this uh, quick little story about uh, pencils and smartphones. Uh, about a year ago, I went to the Miles Schools Conference uh, with uh, Bill Daggett and the International Center for Leadership and Education. And he told this wonderful story about pencils. Back in the Great Depression, not the current one we're in, but the last one. <laughs> <laughs> this one's not so great. Yeah, not so great depression. Um, the education system was facing a major budget uh, crisis, um, not, like, not like, like the one we're in right now. And back before that, every single you know, student had a pencil at their desk. The schools provided the pencils. But then they, they, they were faced with, like, we can't provide pencils for every student now. So what do we do? <laughs> Someone came up with a brilliant idea <coughs> saying, hey, uh, everyone's got a pencil at home. Why not let them bring it to school? Now, novel idea, but the education community went up in an uproar. They're like, no, we can't do that because what would happen? They could use those pencils outside of class and write on walls. <laughs> terrible, terrible thing. Graffiti, defacing a property, terrible. You know, they could use it to pass notes to each other in the hall. No, we don't want that at all. Um, they could use it, oh my gosh, oh, you poke someone's eye out. Someone's <laughs> eye out with that thing. Yeah, terrible. And you know, just use it to cause general distraction. Now that's just a funny little story, but it kind of like you know brings to to light you know how, how you know, we as educators are are resisting that uh, that that uh, uh, by allowing the students to do that, and we're afraid. But the thing is, like as as many of you mentioned here, by allowing it, you're actually creating less chances of, of problems than, than than before. So I hope you remember that story. It's a beautiful story. And last of all, you need access. You know, the internet is key for. A, a lot of the flipped classroom concept. So, so what do we do about internet inequity? Well, um, well, oh, you want me to talk yeah, about? Okay. 
So internet inequity, a lot of people say, well, my student says they don't have internet access at home, so how am I gonna flip the classroom with them? I don't have time, I don't have the equipment to loan out. Well, kids get very creative, right? When they really wanna get on the internet, they all know that there's free internet at most Starbucks, at McDonald's. Um, there's the public library, there are the school libraries, there's their friends' unblocked Wi-Fi at their home, there's their friends' Wi-Fi that's paid for and blocked that they can go and ask when they're sitting at their house, hey, I'm going to do my homework over here because I need access. So um, you may have to make the assignments one or two days out or a week out, you know, to work on this, you know, this that you need internet access to, but there are ways for students to always get internet access. So yes. I know. I was like, I know that's an excuse that a lot of them will use, but if they trust me, if they need a cell phone, they can get their hands on one. If they don't they have one on their own, they know how to get the stuff. <laughs> yes. Is there a way to find out who, what businesses or oh, what just places Google. like that are? Just Google free, free Wi-Fi. Wi -Fi. Okay. And then there's tons of websites. Yeah, you'll that are yeah. Specific to your community. Yeah. So yes. you look at it, and there's people who map out because there's people who go out and look for free Wi-Fi. <laughs> And say this person's got free Wi-Fi, this <laughs> and so on and so forth. So we'll actually map it out, and you actually be able to look Google and say, hey, in our area we have 17 different places you can get Wi-Fi. Yeah, so here's the, here's the map. You can, Google, you can Google map it. Yes. And say, free right. Wi-Fi well, like near me. Yeah. And it'll pop up everything that's within a two-mile radius of you that has free Wi-Fi. See, what we're trying to do is with technology, we're trying to remove barriers of entry and excuses because you can't say, oh, I didn't bring the book home anymore. Everybody's got a device. Everybody's got internet. If you can get to it, you can log in, and that's the key. Is that you know there is no excuse anymore. And last of all, you need online tools, and we're going to spend spend the rest of the time on uh, free tools here. So well, obviously, with technology, one of the things like you, you probably feel is like you know you're bogged down by technology. It's like all this professional development, all this uh, learning. You know, there's, there's a lot of change involved. But one of the things I'm going to uh, point out to you is that technology. Does it have to be this difficult? Mom, Mom, calm down. Listen to me. I know it says click with the mouse, but on a laptop, the trackpad is the mouse. <laughs> now put your finger on it. It doesn't matter which finger. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> now move it down to your email icon. The, the, the little envelope. What do you mean, what does it look like? It looks like an envelope. Exchange it for a salad spinner. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I love Big Bang Theory. Hey, anybody here? Raise your hand if you've been on the receiving end of that phone call. <laughs> Not the only. You're all text heavy pros now. All right, wonderful. Um, yeah. So I mean, but the beauty of the, what I want to point out with this, uh, with all these internet tools, they're designed to be insanely easy. So I'm going to uh, point out a few of them here. So let's go here. Um, about the how. Okay. First thing is uh, we got four categories of, uh, of tools that are out there. Well, first off, you know, there's, there's uh, tools devoted just for project management. So they're used to organize students, group them together, and I'm going to show you a really wonderful free one. Then we're going to go into content creation tools. Uh, we're just going to list them out, but there's a lot, of one, a lot of them out there that allow you to express your own creativity. If you can't get content from other, other places, you can actually very quickly and easily create your own. Then we got content management tools. So, you know, the content's great unless if it's, uh, uh, content's only good unless if you uh, organize in such a way, uh, in a meaningful manner. And that's actually the area that I focus all my effort in, is the content management. But uh, where's the sign-up sheet, by the way? Because uh, um, if, if you came in late, there's a sign-up sheet where uh, basically if you uh, write down your email address, uh, the, the video is recorded, and I'm gonna email you the, that, and also the resources that we're gonna be talking about, or we'll, we'll talk about that. And more. And then we talk about learning management systems. So, so the first one is like this content management system called, uh, not content, project management system called Trello. So I'm going to show you this quick little video, uh, which will really great, do a great job at detailing uh, what this what tool is all about. If you've ever had to coordinate a team of people working on multiple projects, you know that the hardest part is keeping track of where everyone is up to and what everyone is working on. That's what Trello helps you see instantly at a glance. This is Trello. Trello is really simple. It's just a bunch of lists, and each list has on it multiple cards. And each card is one of the uh, little projects that your team is working on. On the right-hand side, you see a bunch of images here. Those are all the people on this team, and they all have access to this board. 
And uh, this particular team is a company called Artist Exploitation Incorporated. What they do is find uh, young garage bands on YouTube and then give them an extreme makeover and uh, then an exploitative recording contract. So on the left-hand side, we have the new bands that we've just found on YouTube. And we've, when we find a new one, all we have to do is click Add Card and type in the name of whoever we found on there. Um, each of these cards has a bunch of stuff on the back of it, which you get to just by clicking on the card. Uh, this one has uh, some voting, as you can see. There's a bunch of conversation, like a little chat here. And of course, you can upload and embed things. So there's an uploaded YouTube video of the uh, band uh, live in work. Uh, the first thing uh, that we're going to do on this team is uh, pick the top uh, ranked bands. Everybody votes on the ones that they like. And the ones that are best, uh, we're going to actually do live in-person auditions. And so we're just going to drag over some of those cards into the audition column in order to choose the ones that need an audition. And then I'm going to assign people to them. So I'm going to assign uh, Lena will be in charge of my little brother. And Tyler is Canadian, so he can do Girlfriend in Canada. And Justin's <laughs> going to do Sedate the Lemmer. And I really like that today, that landmark band. It got a lot of votes. So I'm going to drag it up to the top here uh, so we work on that one first. By the way, this stuff is all happening in a web browser over the internet. And everything is instantly synchronized as you make changes. So whatever changes I make here will immediately show up in all other browsers uh, everywhere else on the internet. And so people can just keep a copy of this uh, open on their desktop and immediately see what's going on with their team as the changes are made. Uh, they'll immediately reflect on them. All right, so if Justin goes in, he does an audition of the Sedate Dilemma Band. He thinks they're really awesome. We're going to sign them up. And we send them over to the makeover department just by dragging them over here. And I'm going to assign our makeover artist, Michael, to work on that. Um, Michael is going to actually just draw a little uh, image of what he thinks the band should look like. Uh, there's his drawing. And upload this uh, to the back of the card where everybody can see it. There we go. And uh, finally, he's going to send it over to the final review process when he's done. And I'm in charge of all the uh, final reviews, so I'm going to assign myself to that card. And uh, when I look at this band, there's a couple of changes that I want to make. So I'm going to add a checklist here of all the things that I want to change. First of all, I think it should be a little bit more glam. Uh, secondly, I want to somehow find a way to exploit the teenage girl's love for vampires and Twilight and everything to do with that whole thing. <laughs> and uh, third, more cowbell. <laughs> Once I've added my checklist, I'm just going to take this card and send it back to the makeover department uh, where Michael's going to go in there and make these changes that I've asked for. He's already got a picture uh, that has a slightly more glam version. And then you can check that off. Uh, for capitalizing on Twilight, he's just going to propose a different name for the band. That should do that. And the cowbell we can always add in post production. No problem. So he sends it to me for final review, and I love it. And I just drag it over to the record first album column, where we assign our recording engineer, John, to work on that. Now, everything of Now, what do you think about that? Anybody here uh, uh, heard of Troll before this? Anybody? Nobody? It's just one of, one of these like you know, hidden seat gems out there for project management. Because I, I actually pay for project management tools until I found this one. And I'm like, this does everything I want. I need to do. It doesn't do everything, but I'll, it's just focused on the core essentials. This is actually done by a company who makes tons of money doing other stuff, and they decided to put this tool because they decided, they built it for themselves out on the internet for free, so anybody can sign up and use it and and and, uh, and do it. So anybody can see the application in the classroom with this. You can see how you can organize this a lot better than using those message boards or or uh, even like a Envoto groups and things like that. This is a great way to they just. Because everything's tracked, everything you can comment on them, and you can really organize it really well. Yes? Can anyone see your information, or is it protected? Oh, it's protected. You, you can make it public or private. So there's a lot of settings on there. So what I would encourage you to do is go to look for Trello. It's actually an app, too. And so you can go to the website. You can do it on the app. And then sign up. Uh, it's absolutely free. And actually use it for your own personal uh, to-do list at first. So you can start you know, using it and manipulating it and seeing what you can do with it. Like, you know, it's a great way to organize your thoughts and things like that. Or even better yet, use it for your spouse to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can say, hey, uh, why is it in the long mode? It's still in the to-do column. I need to go over to the uh, in-action column right now. 
Yes. Now, so, so there's a lot of really great applications for it personally and professionally. So this is actually used in the corporate environment, but hey, education can totally use it. And best part, absolutely free. So that's uh, Trello. Uh, that's actually you know, out of college management, that's probably the best that I've ever encountered. I haven't found any, seen anything better since then. That's free. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next one I'm going to show you here is um, uh, content creation. Well, we're going to just uh, talk a little bit about content creation. This is in case if you uh, can't find it, so there's a lot of variety of ways. Right, there are a lot of things, there's a lot of resources already out there, but I was not super tech savvy when I started um, building my own content and using your phone. You can record yourself on your own phone, okay? You just record yourself on the phone and then you can upload that to your website or wherever you'd like to put it to YouTube. You create the, you know, make those videos, put them up on YouTube, give your kids access to and them. And the point is not to worry about quality production. Record the mistakes, record it as is. You don't have to make it perfect. Because you can go back and revisit it later. So just do it, put it out there, and then, and then move on. And guess what, your students, they're gonna know how to edit it. You're gonna be like, hey, can you edit this for me? And they'll do it in 30 seconds. So you can, <laughs> you can if you want like minimal editing. If yeah. you want to be fancy, yes, it would take a while. But the kids really, they're not looking for your video to be fancy. We're not trying to win awards here. We're trying to get the content to the kids. And we make those mistakes when we're talking to them live as well. You know, so it's okay. Google Drive, how many of you use Google Drive? Yeah, right? yeah. Google Drive, woohoo, it's wonderful, right? It's in real time, you can have a bunch of people collaborating on documents, you can have presentations, you know, all different things, and um, as long as, you know, and you can also control the privacy on Google Drive, whether you make your documents uh, viewable, editable, open to the public, or anyone with a link, or however you'd like to do it. Um, Camtasia, you actually oh, are yeah. more familiar with Camtasia. Right, Camtasia you know, is basically a screen recording program, so you actually do stuff on the screen, it records it, put, makes a video of it, and you can upload it to wherever you want. So you can do moving the mouse around, talking about certain things that are on the screen, such as the PowerPoint or whatever, and then you can, it just records the screen, and you can narrate with it. So it's a very simple tool. That, that one's a paid for one, so there are other free ones, but uh, I only mentioned that because that's the most popular that teachers use right now. Well, then there's Animoto. Yeah, right? and then there's Animoto, which another, is free. Another free one. Yeah. Free is great. Free is wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Animoto does the same thing. And then who here used Prezi before? The souped up PowerPoint presentation. Students love Prezi. Mm -hmm. Students love to use Prezi because they got bored of PowerPoint. Yeah. So yes. um, so kids like it if you put your information up there in a Prezi. And yeah. like you said, there's hundreds more. There's I mean who can name a couple more? Anybody? Content creation tools. Anybody? Oh, edu creations. Oh yeah, education oh, is yes. awesome. Yeah. It's like a, to be able to do Cook Khan Academy. That's an app though on on your iPad. So uh, um, so it's iPad specific, but it's a really great way to do that. Another one is called Explain Everything, which is actually a paid for app. But it does like... But paid for $5 paid for, yeah, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. we're not talking paid for hundreds and hundreds yeah. of dollars, $5 <laughs> investment. It's a, it's a, it's a Starbucks that. copy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I mean, there's a million, uh, lots of really great apps out have, there. Have you ever used Extra Normal? No, I've never even heard of Extra Normal. Google that. <laughs> All right, so there's like lots of creation tools and they're designed to be really easy. Yeah, certain parts of it are. Right? Yeah, and the, and the point is like, you know, find it's something like you're comfortable with, find out what your colleagues are using. There's there's definitely a lot of people out there and, and just, just do it. A lot of these things don't require any learning curve at all. So, um, and that's the beauty is like, you saw tr Trello, Trello, that looked easy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's insanely easy. It doesn't have to be complicated at all. And once the content's done, it's done. If you know you're going to a conference, you have your content done. You want to use it for next year, and the next year, and the next year, and have kids help create content as assignments. Mm -hmm. They create content. You put it into lessons for your younger kids. Lots of ways to use content. All right, now we're going on to learning management systems. So learning management, you know, the, 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 the big uh, two are Blackboard and Moodle. So uh, who here uses Blackboard? Okay, a few, mostly post-secondary. Moodle? It's free, but it takes a lot of work. I mean, uh, so a lot of people are using Edmodo, right? <laughs> Learning management systems are important because you need a way to uh, group students, uh, send them messages, do a lot of these tools that to be able to facilitate like uh, uh, this online learning environment. Um, and these are all wonderful tools. Uh, Blackboard is not free, but I only mention this because that's uh, the incumbent. But then, uh, anyone else use any other learning management systems? Uh, anybody? I see hands. No. Yes. No. No. Nothing else. 
Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Well, then there's this, the C one, which actually stands for, uh, uh, which actually is for uh, Canvas. Uh, Canvas is actually going to be the uh, Blackboard killer. And that one's not free, but it's actually a great uh, learning management system. The only one that's free is Nmodo, and Nmodo is uh, is a really great tool. It's like the Facebook for uh, for schools. So Schoology is free also. Right? Oh, Schoology, yeah. Schoology yeah. is free. It's similar. It's kind of like the college version of Nmodo. Yeah. Well, yeah similar to that. But that, that's free as well. Well, everyone here is uh, secondary, right? Yeah. But you could play around. I mean, my high school, there's a lot of teachers that use it because they prefer it because there's other applications in there. But yeah, you can just find a lot of learning management systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's how you organize students. And then, you know, Trello is great for project management, but doesn't do the overarching organization. Now we got content management. Like you know, we mentioned Google Drive before. That's where you would uh, put content, make it online. What we're trying to do is put, get it into the cloud so that it, students can access it from any, any point in any device. Uh, the importance of, of that is that it's not on the hosted server where you have to be on the internal network or on your computer, so uh, access is key. Uh, you know, a lot of people use Dropbox. Dropbox is like uh, another great uh, tool, like, kind of like a file sharing tool. Google Drive is much better because it provides a lot more tools and more, more gigabytes. I think they gave you five or 15. Right? I think it's 15. 15, it's up to 15, 15. yeah. Yeah, I, I have a paid for account, so I, can't, I, I don't know what they move it to. So, uh, which actually only for like $5 a month, you could get into like, you know, an insane amount of like, yeah, you know, SlideShare is a really great uh, tool for putting PowerPoint slides online, but it's, a, it's an open sharing uh, tool, so you, so other people could. could right, there's no privacy setting on that. That's right. Oh, well, you have to pay for the privacy setting, but oh. uh, but you can find other people's PowerPoint slides using that tool. And then uh, the last one here, KB Compass. Now, you know, KB Compass is very near and dear to my heart, and this is basically kind of what brings back to you know, what why why this is important for me. When when the information when you put information online, you put it in Google Drive, you put it in. Dropbox, you put it on your like you know your learning management system. You're just you're putting it out there. You're trying to organize it in a relevant manner, uh, but there but there isn't a correlation between uh, the information and and results, right? You you give them the information, and you hope that they take a test or they, they, and and pass it, you know, or you hope they pass a quiz. So my biggest focus uh, in my life is creating a tool that actually incorporates gamification, video games, like what I mentioned earlier. Now it actually incorporates reinforcements, constant reinforcements using uh, formative assessments. So I'm going to show you here in the uh, next uh, few minutes uh, is the tool that I developed, which I'm going to say to you is, uh, is absolutely free. Uh, so because I'm, what I'm doing is I'm gi giving this tool for free to educators to use to manage their content and give students a relevant uh, outcome so that they can learn to improve themselves. Now the reason why it's free is because I actually make money doing other things. Just like how Tre Trello and that company that makes money and they decided to, to deploy the tool um, as a free thing, um, we're doing the same thing. Because I, uh, right now, like, you know, the way I, that I actually make money and living is I have content that is already done, uh, you know, package deal, in the uh, learning, in the uh, content management system, in like culinary arts, food science, uh, foods and nutrition, uh, like the foods related area. Because that's actually where I started, like the Chinese restaurant thing, remember? So, uh, so, so I created this content and I built this technology to address kids who are not the best learners. So culinary arts was the field that I focused in because like, you know, we're not doing it like for like higher academics or, or kids who are really great at learning. You know, these are culinary kids. These are kids who are hands-on application. They hate reading. Just like me, I hated reading because I couldn't get it. So what, I, what you're seeing here is this is, a, uh, this is called KB Compass. And this is actually an exclusive offer for free. So I'm going to email you and say, do you want to use this tool? You're going to say yes or no, pass or whatever. But it's, it's, uh, it doesn't cost anything. So, so what you're saying here is this is how I develop uh, the system so that kids will get relevant feedback. All right, what are you here? This is content. You know, the content could be anything. It could be like text, videos, PowerPoint slides. So here's like you know content on food for illness. Wonderful. And then you know we move forward to like the next piece of content, which is uh, a website on uh, blueberry muffins. Uh, so you can put any type of web content in there. Uh, you can come over here. Uh, here's a video taken from YouTube or whatnot. So, so what we're doing is we're organizing content in this, what we call, learning module. So the students are tasked to learn, to go to the learning module and learn the content here. After they're done learning the content, um, what's the first question that a student asks, or anybody asks after you've gone through and you've studied something? Did I actually learn something, right? Did I learn something? Now, the, the way to find out is you usually go to the end of the chapter and answer those 10 silly questions and find out if you missed half of them. Go look up the answers and is that really learning? No. No. <laughs> no, that's not really learning. You're just memorizing and hoping that that's going to be on the test. Obviously, it's not going to be on the test. So, so, that, so that's, that's not a really great form of education. We're training kids to, 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 to take tests and learn, but they're not actually absorbing the information. So what I developed was a mastery system. So 
one of the first things that a student does after they've gone through a study session is they have an opportunity to check their knowledge. Now, this knowledge check is what we call a personal uh, digital tutor interaction. So for, pretend this, like you know, every single student who logs in, they actually have a personalized experience. We're actually tracking how they're using it and we're giving them uh, relevant feedback. So when they click on this button, it's just like me saying to a tutor, hey tutor, I just studied this information. Tell me if I know this stuff. And the tutor will say, okay, I'm gonna ask you questions about every single topic in here ran randomly. And after you've answered all the questions, then I'm gonna give you feedback. I'm gonna give you these colors. Obviously, you know, red means bad. So that just, the tutor saying to the student, you need to go back and really study hard on those two topics of information. Whatever that information is, you've proven to me that you don't know that information. So go and say that, really. Spend a lot of time on that. These, you did okay on. You know, you have room for improvement. Uh, you've proven to me that you know some stuff, but you are not at scholar level. We have three levels of mastery. Novice, apprentice, scholar. We let them level up, you know, level up, <laughs> right? And then, uh, so, so we're just focusing on the colors here. So what happens is, like, you know, now the student knows, okay, I have two really uh, hard focus areas that I need to study. In fact, the system, or the tutor, will automatically remove the, the content that the student has already, oops, I went too far, but uh, has already proven that they mastered. So, so now when they look at, okay, over click, but, but you're seeing that, like, you know, the, the content gets narrowed. So now they know what they have to focus on. And then after they go through a second study session, they go back to the tutor and say, now, I just spent more time on this, how well did I do? And then the tutor will say, well, good, you did better on this, I'm gonna level you up from orange to green and, uh, and remove that content. This one you did better on too, and I'm gonna put a green arrow moving up, but you haven't leveled up enough. You know, this one here, you actually did worse, so I'm gonna put a red arrow pointing down. And I'm gonna tell you that you actually showed less, less knowledge about that piece of content that you previously did. I got lucky. <laughs> yes, exactly. So what we're trying to do, this is a mastery system. We're trying to get them to master the content through a remediation process and also through relevant and, and immediate feedback. Because that's one of the things that I needed was I needed immediate feedback. I didn't want to wait till the next day. I didn't want to wait to, to, to class and take that quiz and fail it and then move on. You know, that's, that's the problem. I wanted to know. So it, 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 most people can't afford a personal tutor. Most people, uh, parents don't have the time to be able to be there to help them through this thing. So what I did was I built an automated system that's all online that actually does this for them. So in the end, what happens is like, you know, they start to remediate the content, they, so they're repeating the information, taking our tests, narrowing the focus, and eventually until they get to the point where they have like one piece of information that they're going over and over again until they get. That's the mastery process. So when they're done, you know, they have all this relevant feedback. If I were to walk into class and take a summative exam on Friday, so this is all formative, completely formative. Uh, if I want to take a summative exam, I know how I'm going to do, because this is what the system is telling me. They're getting an in-depth painting of their brain, because this is what the, the digital system thinks that. So it's, right now, if I look at this, I don't know this information. I don't know this information. So it puts the onus on the student to say, hey, I'm going to spend maybe another 10 more or 15 more minutes studying that information so I can pass that exam. Or they can decide to go and play another half hour on Call of Duty. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, and play uh, and shoot some people. But the thing is, the decision's up to them. The mystery's gone because we're telling them they know this or they don't know this information. So it puts the responsibility into their own hands as opposed to waiting. So instead of like, instead of waiting for the test on Friday and say, oh, I bombed it, let's move on. Now they can walk into class and I have mostly reds here, then I'll know that I'm gonna bomb it. But then actually you as a teacher will actually be able to see this too and they can say, uh-uh, you're not taking this test until I've, I've I've gone through this information with you, or something like that. So, like, you know, so you get to be able to monitor your students, your students' uh, modules. You can see that you know these areas are bad, so you can actually go and address the students. The numbers in the parentheses represent how many times the student has engaged with the digital tutor or the, the, the remediation process. So, and so like this case 24. Actually, that's not a bad thing because this is an IEP student. It requires multiple rounds to be able to learn it, and this person's passing the summative exam. So that's actually a good thing. And you can see who are the coasters and who are the, the ones who are just doing thing, just enough to get by, but there's really nothing you can do about that. But what we're doing is we're, I'm providing a tool so that the kids who want to excel on their own, now they have the opportunity to. We're trying to give them a smorgasbord of choices uh, and, and be able to uh, address their best learning uh, methodology. So, so here we have this, uh, and the, uh, the way that, that I designed the system, it actually incorporates Google Drive. So if you have Google documents, videos, and things like that, you can easily 
throw it in there. If you have websites or your content that are from other websites, you can throw it in there. All the system needs to be able to function is content, and obviously the content has to be good, and questions. So we actually use a, uh, a, a, a theory called uh, abundant assessments and I'm response theory. So every single page of content that I showed you earlier has a large bank of questions. So, uh, so let me just show you this really quick here. But actually, let me just ask uh, for your feedback. You know, this is something that's very brand new, bleeding edge methodology and technology, at least in my opinion, and, and the things that I've experienced, because this is my area of focus. What do you all think about that? Think it's cool? Yeah. yeah? Are you all awake? Yeah. <laughs> no, hold on. Yes, yeah, you saw your reason. Um, questions, like how much work does the teacher have to put in? Like, I know that they have to answer questions, but does that mean we need to upload the questions and the answers in order for this to be utilized? Uh, yes, actually. So I, have, I actually have teachers who, like, you know, if you take the time, like for example, this uh, this content here, uh, each each content piece should have that minimum five questions, because when we have also artificial intelligence built in, it actually starts to learn the content. So it's it's called item response theory, and what happens is this this tutor is actually a smart tutor, and this tutor uh, knows that after he, after this tutor has asked this question to let's say 30 students, and of those 30, 80% of them get correctly the tutor will automatically know that it's an easy question. So they'll downgrade that question to a lower priority and not ask it during the first round of, of uh, assessments. Whereas this one here, let's say 40% of them get it correctly the first time, then what happens is the, the, the digital tutor will say, I'm gonna ask this question because I consider it harder based on experiential data, and this one here, uh, and so on and so forth. And if the students answer those questions that I deem harder, then they deserve that green dot because they beat the odds. Because it's experiment, experiential, not subjective. So, so, so to answer your question, yes, uh, uh, the, the questions there, there needs to be a, a good number of questions for the system to work. Otherwise, it'll fall flat on its face. Minimum five, average nine. The more, the merrier. If you can get like a whole lot of questions, that's great. Because one of the things we're I'll get to your uh, question in a second. One of the things we're trying to train the, the students to really do differently is instead of looking at a piece of content and say, I'm going to highlight this because I feel it might be on the test. I'm going to highlight this because I feel like uh, that might be on the test. Students are wasting effort trying to second guess the system. So they're not really learning the content, they're just trying to memorize little bits and pieces thinking that it's going to be on the test. So with the budget assessments, what we're doing is we're saying everything is fair game. You might get asked a question about this piece of data, this piece of data, who knows? So we want you to study everything. <laughs> it's not about fluff anymore, it's about the absorption and mastery of the content that you present them. So, so because of that, you're not just writing one or two assessment questions trying to say, okay, if they pass this question, therefore they should, it's the representation that they know this answer. You know, whether it be you know, an understand or analyze question or something like that, which are really great questions. But the, the key is that like, you know, we're trying to say like, you know, everything is fair game. Yes, your question. Um, I, I understand you have had the five questions minimum or whatever. Yes. Is it possible to justify the first year and then like next year when I reteach it, I add another five? Oh, yeah. Or is it one of those once you create it, it's done? No, you, you okay. add it. You customize it every day. Better. So you can think of it this way. The first year, you give the digital tutor, I have this piece of content, I have, five, I have five questions for everything. So all I have is five questions to work with. Next year, you go, hey, I'm going to load you with more information. And the tutor will say, thank you. I have more choices now. You know, the more data you can give the, the, the tutor, the, the more intelligent you can become. I'm just trying to think of ways to make a little bit yeah, of a... Yeah, instead of making <laughs> yeah, this like, you have to do... Uh, no, you can start... You don't have to time. build the whole thing at once. But for it to yeah. be most it's effective is when it has all this okay. together. But, I mean, because if you, you, you get a YouTube your video process. in there, you could write five questions about that video. But to, to start out, to begin to flip your classroom, you can do it in stages. And, and there's you can a, build whatever class you want for free, which is awesome. And as you can see, there's blue text out. Text out <laughs> built right into it as well. Um, oh, I was going to uh, make mention one point, but I can't remember now. I just lost my train of thought. So uh, anyway, yes, your question. Your, your I was going to say something. Uh, keep it, you also had the kids make the questions. So uh, they can do the read thing, read content, and then you can have your kids submit questions in. I mean, you got 30 kids in your room. They do one or two questions. They go, see the question, maybe. Right there, of course, you can go through and read them or whatever, but I mean, that's the way you, they might think of things that you wouldn't think to even ask. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Like I've had that. kids write finals. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so to create a question, you just go, okay, true, false, short, short answer, multiple choice. 
You can add essay questions. There's actually a tool in here to create summative exams. And if we have time, I'll show you. Actually, you might. Um, it, unless if somebody has to really run. Um, and you choose the Bloom's taxonomy. Once you save it, it'll be added to the question bank right here. Uh, adding content's very simple. And, uh, and actually, I'm going to show you one really amazing uh, piece of tech that's actually not being employed anywhere that, that I know of in education. Um, this is uh, this is basically like kind of like the Star Trek moment, I say, because this is like a pure science fiction but brought to reality. Uh, one of the things that we allow you to do is you can create a summative exam here. So we have a test tool, and you can actually uh, check uh, questions off based on uh, what the question bank is down here. So you see these checkmark boxes, etc. Now, what happens is the system that is actually not only um, uh, tracking how the students learn the information, I mean the, what, what they answer, but it's actually tracking their learning behavior. You know, like Amazon does, when you go shopping, it's actually tracking your shopping behavior. So they have a shopping profile designed just for you, and they actually built a personal shopper that's online. So they want to try to get you to buy stuff. What we're doing is we're taking the same web technologies like what Amazon is doing, like Netflix, everything, uh, all these other like you know, companies that are Fortune 500, and we're applying it towards education. So instead of building a shopping profile, we're building a personal learning profile. So we're actually understanding their learning behavior. We know what they're looking at. We know how long they're staying on. We're actually using, using that data to do comparative data. So we actually measure, like, you know, if this student's successful, how is that compared to this other student? And, that, and then we can actually start to draw correlations about like, you know, what can we do to change to create more student success. But that's neither here nor there but, uh, about like, you know, what we're doing right now, which is, uh, we have this tool called Test Overlay. So this is actually uh, as part of the tool. You know how the tutor gets uh, smarter over time? Well, the tutor actually starts to build an understanding of the student. So this button's here that's, that lets you ask the what if question. What if um, I were to give these set of questions that I just selected to my students, and I can actually print it out as a, as a test here with an answer key. Um, what if I gave this set of questions to my students at this very second? You know, tutor, please tell me how well it would perform. And the tutor will say, well, um, based on this question selection that you just made, I'm going to run a series of quick algorithms in my head, because I could do that. <coughs> and I'm going to tell you what my thoughts were of their grade and the level of certainty the student will get that grade. Mm -hmm. Now, if the students are engaged in the system correctly, we've actually, this tool has been out for about, this, we invented it about a year ago. Teachers have reported 70 to 80 percent accuracy on our predictions, which is phenomenal because we're actually analyzing much, much more data. So, so this is incredible. So because like you know now we can actually take a guess and we know what how students are doing. So you can actually do something to circumvent, intervene. You can actually export the data. So so if you need uh, you know data to analyze and prove to uh, to people uh, about this information, you can actually export that. It's just a phenomenal tool, and that's because we're harnessing the power of the web and making it so that the tool can be used for relevant uh, research and information so that we could actually analyze their learning behavior. What do you think about that? Awesome. Yeah, like it? Yes? Okay, question. Two questions. One, is it protected? Or two, if someone's teaching the same content in another state, can they get access to another teacher's test? Uh, great question. Uh, the content, uh, well, the, 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 the accounts are password protected. So, okay. yes, they're protected. Uh, so only you can see that the resulting data. And only the student can see whatever content you should place in the classes and things like that. Uh, can another teacher see that content? Now, if you create the content, it's for your own use right now. That's, that's the, 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 uh, the tool as is. In the future, we're going to be building sharing tools. But that's not, that's not there for another four or five, no, six, six months. So. Okay. so once that tool becomes available, they'll be like, hey, I just built this module. Here, you use it. Here, you use it. Here, you use it. Well, here, you buy it, or something like that. So, so that's, that's the tool. So, um, that's why I wanted to show you because this is where I have all my passion in. Because all the tools out there, they don't really tie in the, 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 the content with relevant data, with the rel relevant feedback. And what, what I've designed is something that really gives students immediate feedback. They know exactly what, what they need to work on, and it's constant. And, it's, and they actually can level up, and they could, there's a lot of gamification that they even have a chance to get into uh, in here. So, so that's absolutely free. You can use it as a tool, and then uh, and if you want to stick around, I can show you how to do it. But it's really easy. You just type in a website. And it's you got that content. Put in the Google Doc. You, you say I want to use these documents in a Google Form, and it just goes right in. Because just like Trello, it's designed to be simple. Keep it simple. You know, don't bog it down with a million things. We focus on the two primary actions: get the students to the content, get them to learn that content, and make it simple. So, thank you very much.
Thank you, Linda, for your time, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to be around for the rest of the day here, and uh, feel free to see me. I'm going to send the invitation out, and if anybody wants it now, I can actually set up an account for you now, if you want. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the conference. Uh,